So let's get started. So when we're farming, it's really about managing an ecology. And ecology sometimes get lost in our ideas about what management really is, but the fact of the matter is we're really managing all the components of a system to make the best possible environments for our plants to thrive and achieve their highest quality. And in every environment and in every ecology, there are two parts, the abiotic and the biotic parts. In the abiotic, or non-living part of our environment, mineral nutrition is at the heart of how our plants protect themselves from associated abiotic stressors, like drought or extreme cold. From copper and its role in protecting against cold, to zinc for heat stress, manganese for drought stress, mineral nutrition is critical to living in a variable climate. It's critical to living in any climate, but especially where you have swings in temperature and extreme variations in vintages. It gets even more interesting when you get into the biotic factors or the biological factors of pests and disease. The health and high function of plants is the direct result of the mineral status, the mineral nutrition status in those plants. And our job in managing the ecology of our farms is facilitating access to those mineral nutrients. And furthermore, that means not tying the figurative hands of the plant behind its back so that it can't do the job that it wants to do for you. So the reason we're here today is to talk about herbicidal mode of action in any chemical input and the relevance of mode of action to the health and nutritional status of our crops, so the, so the actual things that we're trying to grow, and the ecosystems. And to do that, to understand those things, we have to start with this process of chelation. The word chelation comes from the Greek word kel for crab's claw, and that's actually a really beautiful way to picture the phenomenon also, because chelation is simply how molecules will grab onto a metal ion, so a mineral ion, and bind them in a chelate. That's the, that's the product. A chelate is the product of chelation. And without chelation, many mineral nutrients would be inaccessible, so they would be lost to precipitation in the environment before they even are of use in a biological system. So chelation is a, is a very important natural process. Critical minerals, and this is a diagram kind of illustrating how this works, critical minerals like calcium or magnesium, upon entering a plant cell or a human cell, will immediately form chelates with organic acids within that cell, and that enables those nutrients to move freely within the body of the plant or, or your body. In the soil environment, organic substances that are produced by soil microbes will also form chelates with inorganic forms of mineral nutrition and make those plant accessible. That's one of the biggest jobs of soil microbial life is to make inorganic forms of nutrition available to plants, and that's through the process of chelation. So therefore, if you want to think about it, it's just that binding and holding of elements, but it can also go in the other direction. Chelation can also pull minerals out of their chelates and make them inaccessible to plants. But in either direction, you can understand the importance of chelation to the access of nutrients of our plants. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. The role of minerals with respect to plant quality can really be compared to the potential power of the combustion engine. I mean, that power to move thousands of pounds across the land, over oceans, through skies, all made possible by this really magnificent feat of human ingenuity. But without the key to turn that engine on, you just have a really heavy, useless piece of metal. And just to illustrate photosynthesis, which is something that we're all pretty familiar with, is a very critical process that has at its heart an enzyme that has one elemental key that catalyzes that reaction that yields the products of sugar and oxygen. If you were to look back into your ninth grade mind and you remember that it's something like CO2 plus H2O plus light equals C6H12O6 and O2, there's a lot that's lost in that very simplified equation. So it turns out that photosynthesis is a very complex process that has at its heart a, a metallic enzyme that uses abundant manganese and calcium. So in this photo, you can see this little, I have this awesome little tool here. This is the metalloenzyme that has four manganese and 
um, and an oxygen that are all part of this process right here. And without that metalloenzyme, you basically stop photosynthesis. So you need to have manganese to make photosynthesis happen. It's when the manganese atoms actually receive photon energy, so they get that light energy and it excites those electrons, that sets, that sets in motion that photooxidation of water that yields molecular oxygen. And that's part of photosystem two in photosynthesis, and that's where almost all of the oxygen on planet Earth comes from. So without manganese, it's not just CO2 plus H2O. Without those elements, you can't make it go. And if you want to go back to that analogy of the engine, those are the keys that turn that on, make it happen in real time. So 18 elements are required by plants to grow and function. Many of us feel that there are several more that are important, but these are the ones that get the attention. The first three are the structural ones, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and that's very much covered by photosynthesis, which we were just going over. But then we get into macronutrients and micronutrients. But in every case, these are elements, and they carry a charge. And remember valence electrons, the electrons that are in the out outer shell, those are the ones that determine the charge of those elements. Elements that lose electrons are positively charged because they have more protons and those are called cations. The ones that gain electrons are negative. Uh, I'm sorry, the negatively charged elements are called anions, and you guys are all familiar with this if you deal with plant nutrition at all. But those charges affect how or if a plant can gain access to those nutrients. Those charges really do determine the movement of an element within the plant. And most of our pests and diseases are actually manifestations of nutritional imbalances. That's true in our bodies, it's true in our plants. The nutritional imbalance in your body makes those processes that depend on that mineral impossible to complete. So you get a dampening in your immune system over time. So like I said, minerals function within plants in many ways. They're part of that physical structure. They feed the plant. And as I just said, they're also the keys to the very powerful enzymes that basically do almost all of the work in our plants and our bodies. They're the keys to those engines. And without the key, those pathways are inhibited or completely shut down. And when we want to affect the physiology of a plant, it's actually very simply done by controlling the availability of minerals. It's not always so easy to target that, but that's basically the function of our pesticides. To stop enzymatic function, you pull the mineral key for that enzyme. And again, that process is called chelation. I'm going to keep repeating things that need repeating so they sink in. There's only a few things that you really need to remember today. In the case of herbicides, chelation and those chelates formed is a way of preventing access to a certain mineral that catalyzes an enzymatic pathway, and that shuts down that pathway and controls the physiology of that plant. And almost without exception, every pesticide on the market is a chelator of some kind. And that's, I mean, just to kind of bring this all into focus, that's the prime thing of what we're trying to focus on today, is when we're controlling access to minerals, you have to understand what minerals you're targeting, or you don't understand the way that thing is acting in the environment. Because with a lot of these things, they're not targeted specifically at a certain plant that you're, you think you're targeting. They behave in the environment sort of universally the same way. So the elements chelated by an herbicide determine the physiological function that, that the herbicide interrupts. And that's how we determine what we call mode of action. For example, the herbicides that pull elements that are necessary for photosynthesis, like manganese, like we were just talking about, those are applied post-emergence and are generally fairly, fairly fast-acting. On the other hand, the herbicides that chelate elements that are necessary for cell division in an embryo, those are usually called the pre-emergence, and they're sprayed pre-emergence. Furthermore, some do target pathways that are specific to a class of plants, like graminoids or broad-leaved plants. And those are considered to have a fairly confined spectrum of efficacy. They also tend to be heavier and longer lasting in the environment. Chemicals that target pathways that are common to all plants and often other organisms as well are called broad-spectrum, non-selective, or non-target. 
In many cases, as in nearly all of the growth regulators and oxidant inhibitors, the specific sites for action are still unknown. <laughs> Over the decades, these herbicides had resisted efforts to determine their chemical basis for that phytotoxicity. And that elusivity and our lack of understanding has led to a lot of misuse of those chemicals as well. So I encourage everyone, and this is about glyphosate today, the things in your barn or the things that you work with on a daily basis, they often get presented to you by a label or by a chemical representative who has maybe a cursory understanding of mode of action but the actual elements chelated and why you need to know that hopefully will become clear today. So, to get to glyphosate, the molecule of the day. I'm, I've looked at this molecule for years now in its very incredible simplicity and unparalleled success on the market. How does it work? Well, glyphosate is the molecule N-phosphonomethylglycine, and because of that thing that just happened, I'm not going to say it that way anymore today. <laughs> we'll call it glyphosate. But it's C3H8NO5P, very simple molecule. And it's unique in several ways, but especially in its history. The molecule was originally synthesized in 1950, but to very little effect. The gentleman who actually synthesized it first in a laboratory didn't even publish his work. Fourteen years later, glyphosate was rediscovered and was patented by the Stouffer Chemical Company as a very, very powerful broad-spectrum mineral chelator. And just to put that in perspective, a common household um, mineral chelator is called Drano. They use it to clean pipes. But this was for use in industrial settings because it's very effective at cleaning industrial boilers and pipes of the scaling that happens, the accumulation of calcium and heavy metals over time. Interestingly, glyphosate, because of its very unique capacity for chelating with these metals, it can destabilize a multitude of enzymatic pathways. So glyphosate specifically chelates all positive cations. So all of the cations, calcium, magnesium, potassium, manganese, zinc, I mean, there's a lot of them. That's just to name a few. But it was the identification of its interrupt interruption of a specific pathway the Shikimet pathway that led to its next two patents. First is an unprecedented herbicide. The second is a very powerful antimicrobial, or what we call antibiotic. So it's patented for both things. Glyphosate is a chelator. It chelates the positive cations, calcium, magnesium, all those that I listed, and it's the immobility of those ions that shuts down the function of the Shikimet pathway by destabilizing one enzyme. It's the EPSPS enzyme. It's also the long name is the 5 enol pyruval shikimet 3 phosphate synthase enzyme. Yay! <laughs> I also won't be saying that a lot today. Um, but that shikimet pathway is the biological pathway in plants and what, what science has decided to call the lower organisms, like bacteria and fungi. But that is the biological pathway that synthesizes the aromatic amino acids tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. Those are the three aromatic amino acids that are part of those essential amino acids to all living things, okay? So only lower organisms have that pathway, but we all need those amino acids. Is that clear? So animals and humans do not have that pathway, and hence, there was a very strong perception of safety early on in, in glyphosate's history, and you can see how things have transpired since then. So Monsanto won its herbicidal and antibiotic pat patents and label approval on the, on, on the identification that it shuts down that EPSPS enzyme and the shikimet pathway. But glyphosate, we now know, actually shuts down or down-regulates 291 known enzymes, and I listed some of the more important ones here just for you to look at. We'll get back to some of these later, and you can actually see that the EPSPS enzyme is far less influenced by glyphosate than some of these other ones, but we'll talk about that later. Glyphosate is labeled 
uh, for use as a foliar application in agricultural settings. It's used as an herbicide, a growth regulator, and also as a ripening desiccant. Everybody know what a ripening desiccant is? No. So in, in a lot of um, annual um, row crop production settings, if you're, say, doing wheat or barley or oats or something like that, if your field is not um, homogenous in terms of its trajectory of ripening and you've got a date that you want to harvest before the rains come, you will go out and spray glyphosate to desiccate the field and quote unquote ripen the field so that it can be harvested at the same moisture content. Glyphosate is a systemic chemical. This is something that I, I actually, in interviewing farmers, find that a lot of people don't understand. This is a systemic chemical that rapidly translocates through a plant and accumulates in meristematic and reproductive tissue. Meristematic tissue is the growing points, reproductive tissue is the part that we harvest. Glyphosate is stable and active within a plant and it does not dissipate within a plant over time. Plants cannot metabolize glyphosate. There's nothing within a plant and its metabolism that can do anything with that molecule. Within the plant, glyphosate chelates cations, notably manganese, but all the other ones too, and that's what shuts down that EPSP enzyme. And this is a diagram, it's, it's even a pretty simplified diagram, if you can believe it or not, <laughs> of that shikimate pathway. But like I said, that pathway is the primary pathway for the synthesis of phenolics and terpenoids. So for any winemakers in the room, those words should resonate with you. But in plants, phenolics, in addition to being very important in wine, those are the defense compounds. These defense mechanisms, primarily antioxidant in nature, are also related to their beneficial implications for human health. So we hear a lot about how phenolics and antioxidants are important for human health. Well, that's the pathway that makes those compounds. And the inability of a plant to produce phenolics renders it susceptible to pests and soil-borne pathogens. And that's how you basically kill the plant. As you can see from the diagram here, and I wanted to show this, so up in the corner there where, the, um, where those little symbols are, those are the cations that are notably chelated by glyphosate, but there are many others. But these play a role in the shikimate pathway, and they're, they're kind of, their symbols are at various points in that. And that's where those cations, or those trace minerals, are playing a role in catalyzing that, that next reaction step. So you can see that even though we interrupt the EPSPS enzyme up there at the top with chelating manganese, at any point down the road, you're also chelating everything else and interrupting those pathways from getting any further down the way. So while it's important to note that <laughs> you do it here, trace minerals are called trace minerals for a reason. Plants don't need great quantities of them. They need minuscule quantities of them but they are the keys to those enzymes. If you pull that tiny amount, you affect downchain reactions that, are, that have huge implications for the health of your plants. And just to kind of give you a sense of how these, um, how these three aromatic amino acids work in plants, and this is just to name a few ways, phenylalanine is probably the most important for winemaking purposes um, because that's the precursor to all of the flavonoids. It's your all of your color compounds, anthocyanins, they protect against pathogens. Coumarins have appetite suppressing properties, which is becoming more and more important for humans. <laughs> it's also a very important precursor to lignin formation. And so for anybody who wants to grow a plant that can stand up, you should care about lignin formation. Tyrosine is also important for plastoquinone formation. Cyanogenic glucosides are the, um, the derivatives of that pathway. They are very good at protecting against herbivory, insect predation. And then tryptophan, um, while you all may be familiar with tryptophan because of its postprandial effect on your own body after um, turkey dinner, those are really important in plants because they also protect against herbivory. Those are very bitter compounds, and so when plants taste them, they don't like them, and they're also important for plant growth regulation. So pulling any one of these trace minerals out at any point will shut down all of those pathways. While the micronutrients 
or trace minerals are a very small percentage of the makeup of the plant. I think we can start to appreciate the roles of cations in grape physiology especially and how essential they are to plant function. Because like I said, they play critical roles but in tiny amounts. So regulating that amount is really best left to the plant because when we try to go and microdose those things in, it's very clumsily done because it's going to be affected by all of those environmental factors that are outside of your control, the accessibility of those things. It's really best for the plant to be able to control that. Magnesium being the metal linchpin of chlorophyll, manganese at the heart of photosynthesis, all those micronutrient cations are critical from cell division all the way through berry ripening. You really can't find a single process that doesn't require adequate micronutrition. Mineral micronutrients are so critical that to give you a sense of how many things you could affect by just chelating one of them <laughs> would be enough. But since we are literally looking at all of them being chelated by glyphosate, I think that's the starting point for why we might want to reconsider their use. And in, in many of the cases with the micronutrients, if you were to pull one out, a deficiency in one often looks like toxicity of another. So they, they actually swap out for one another. The chemistry is very difficult to control. And again, that's a reason why it's best for the plant to be able to regulate those things itself. So I thought people would find this interesting. A glyphosate treatment in sterile soil actually doesn't kill a plant. Um, it's, it's sort of a secondary um, function of being exposed to whatever's in the soil. So this is a, um, a clinical trial that was done where you, you're basically in sterile soil or, or field soil and then you have a control with no glyphosate and you can see that the plant is diminished for sure, that those pathways aren't completing their function, but that's still a live plant. You put it in a field soil and it's, it's dead right away. And I put this in here for a reason because I think that one of the things that we overlook is that cumulative exposure of our plants over time often would go unnoticed or chalked up to some other effect of the environment where that cumulative exposure over time in, plant, in plants which cannot metabolize glyphosate has obvious implications. Anecdotally, I have observed in our community a rise in discussions over micronutrition and I don't remember that being so much of a discussion point in the past. I also feel like there are emerging diseases that I don't think that we saw as much of in the past and I know that these that there's always lots of variables that affect such things but it bears noting. In controlled experiments up to 20 percent of glyphosate applied to plants is released into the soil via the root exudates. So those plants are actually sending glyphosate into the soil and it's unmetabolized so it's in pure form. So that compound also remains in the plant residues after the plants die. And if you add that to the amount that we accidentally directly spray on soil, there's an un undeniable quantity of glyphosate that enters the soil system over time. That strong absorption, so the binding of glyphosate to soil, was actually one of its perceived benefits um, upon its release to the consumers. <laughs> and in perennial systems, the safety of glyphosate to our crops is actually um, sort of believed to be because we're not spraying it on green tissue. So we think, you know, in perennial systems, because we have bark on our trunks, we're spraying the ground where the weeds are growing, that we're not actually exposing our plants to any glyphosate. However, suckers, adventitious buds, any trunk wounds, um, and also new and growing roots are going to be pathways for uptake. But furthermore, and this, was, this has been debated for a long time, but there's a lot of proof about this now, root uptake of soil adsorbed glyphosate has been shown in perennial and annual crops. So that's actually a thing that happens. Um, and I'm happy to share all the evidence of that in my bibliography especially when you add surfactants into the mix, that makes it that much more likely. 
Glyphosate is both xylem and phloem active, so it goes both ways in the plant. Um, and for both foliar and root uptake, glyphosate translocation is very rapid, and it moves right into those sink tissues, so the meristematic and the reproductive tissues. And I'm just going to say it again, the plants do not have any ability to, glyphos uh, to metabolize glyphosate. Absorption through the roots has been shown in lots of crop species, including including perennial uh, tree crops and vines, and also lots of annual crops like beets and barley and cotton and maize and rapeseed and all the other things. And that exposure pathway through the roots is really important because if you think about field runoff, especially in high water events, those roots are the primary interception point for all the glyphosate that's coming from wherever. It's from the soil environment that most of the mineral nutrients are accessed, but especially the micronutrients. Glyphosate is touted for binding tightly to soil and having rapid biological degradation. I, re I actually remember when I first started in the Forest Service and they were all handing us our backpack sprayers because we didn't have a fire to fight or a trail to build or whatever, and they were like, this stuff is biodegradable. Um, I mean, that was the, the, that's a very strong memory that I have, um, and that, binding or adsorption of glyphosate in soil actually presents its own sort of unique issue, which is the immobilization of mineral nutrients in the soil as well. So in addition to having an effect on soil microorganisms, you're actually sequestering micronutrition in the soil from being plant accessible. And rates as low as 3%, so 1 40th of the recommended rate, field rate of glyphosate application, was able to um, diminish the amount of plant uptake and translocation of iron by 50%, manganese by 80%, zinc and boron by up to 10%. And if you think about how much of, how much of any of those things our plants need, diminishing it in any quantity is going to have a serious implication for plant health. But that much for iron alone, I mean, just in terms of how these minerals will swap themselves in for each other, if they're de deficient in one thing, you can create a major imbalance in a very short period of time, just 3% of a recommended field application. That's a one-time study. At the time of glyphosate's approval and acceptance as a commercial herbicide, it really did seem like a, a dream come true. I, and I, I say this honestly. I mean, I feel like most of the people that I love and trust at one point embrace this chemical like it was a green panacea. Glyphosate's herbicidal action was labeled for its disruption of this pathway that humans and animals didn't have. We thought it was safe. Everybody thought it was safe. Not only did it appear to kill very effectively across all plant taxa, with literally no exceptions, the fact that humans and higher animals didn't have that was pretty much its fast pass into production. And again, the shikimate pathway is present in plants, fungi, bacteria, but not animals. Furthermore, at the time, the benefits of our own gut microflora, you know, so our bacterial biome was very unknown at the time. And if anything, we were still in that antibiotic embrace. So the fact of glyphosate's concurrent patent as an antibiotic was also part of the world embracing it the way that it did. It just seemed so safe. <laughs> but plants through their roots send the soil anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of the products of photosynthesis to the soil. Why do they do that? To feed the microbes. And why feed those microbes? Well, it's because just like we can't, plants can't actually get their nutrition by themselves. We can't digest our food without those microbes. And in turn, bacteria and fungi are fed by the plants. They, they, it's this whole nice symbiosis. And they take those inorganic forms of the minerals and make them plant accessible. Remember that in the soil, the sand fraction is quartz and carries no charge. The primary non-organic measure of a soil's fertility is related to the clay fraction, which is important for us. We have a lot of a relatively high amount of clay in our soils because that carries a negative charge. So that's how it can bind and attract cations. Glyphosate's unique structure allows it to interfere by chelating those cations. So that actually pulls them off of the clay molecules. 
and it changes the arrangement and that spatial relationship of minerals in the soil. This is something most people don't think about. <coughs> the molecule of glyphosate, and I put it here, I put it in a lot of slides just so people can look at it. I've looked at it so long. It is so unique in its structure. Glyphosate is actually just the, whoop, I'm sorry, backwards. Go back, okay. This in the middle, that, that little spot right there, that's the amino acid glycine. Glycine is the smallest of the amino acids and it is universally used in protein synthesis. The other parts of that molecule are just a PO3, basically. It's a phosphite end. That structure is incredibly simple and it's incredibly unique and that is why glyphosate is so effective. It has these two points where it can intercept almost anything that is working importantly in the soil, in your body, and that gives it broad spectrum efficacy, but it's also, you know, one of the things that really raises my hair. Um, adsorption, therefore, in the soil environment is going to be very dependent on your soil pH, on your soil organic matter, because glyphosate, unlike most other herbicides, doesn't want to have anything to do with your soil organic matter. It really doesn't care about soil organic matter. It really cares about your clay and the cations. So it's going to stick there and be more persistent in a low pH, high clay soil than a really sandy or even one of the higher pH soils in the Midwest. Here we're very low pH, and so glyphosate is particularly persistent at low pHs. I know that this is getting into the weeds a little bit for chemistry and soil nerds, but it, I think it's important for us to take a moment with this soil structure thing. Because soil colloid structure is in large part related to how the minerals arrange themselves in those lattices based on their charges, especially in high clay content soils. In the mineral co components of soil, it's that clay that has the capacity to hold the cations. The way those minerals arrange themselves in three dimensions is going to be both affected by the sequestration of those cations, but also that spot right here, that phosphonic group on glyphosate, that actually competes for phosphorus, for inorganic phosphorus in the soil environment for points on the exchange sites of your soil colloids. So glyphosate will actually bind to your soil colloid and bounce off phosphorus that would otherwise be available for your plants. And phosphorus, we all know, it's like one of the building blocks of life. It's the backbone of DNA. And a few studies looking at water infiltration rates in field conditions with just a few glyphosate applications. So not 10 or 25 or 40 years of glyphosate applications, but just a few years worth of applications of glyphosate showed that there were declines, significant declines, in soil porosity and water infiltration. If you add that to the de, sort of destabilization of microbial life and also invertebrate life in the soil that is an, another effect of glyphosate, you're getting a two-fold attack on your soil structure. And if you think about why we use herbicides in the first place, this should give us all pause. Competition for water and nutrients is the most quoted reason for herbicide use. So if you're changing your soil structure and limiting soil porosity and diminishing access to mineral nutrients, that's just math. Sorry. So we're going to go another step now, and we're going to get into the bugs. Glyphosate inhibits the shikimate pathway. And to reiterate, and I know that I keep repeating stuff, but that's that metabolic pathway that the lower organisms use to biosynthesize those aromatic amino acids, which are essential, tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenyl phenylalanine. In plants, the aromatic amino acids are critical for processes that are primarily related to defense. In microbial life, those aromatic amino acids are the building blocks for proteins and a lot of other compounds, but primarily proteins. Soil microbes take that carbon in the form of sugars from the plants, and they form those complex molecules and feed the plants, and they also create arable tilth in your soil. The way plants access mineral nutrition is through that network of soil, soil flora and fauna, and they work synergistically in a rhizosphere together. That process remains healthy only as long as there is a, a, 
a stasis between the protagonists and the antagonists. There are, there are oxidizing animals in the ground and there are reducing animals in the ground and those things have to have stasis with one another. Nature does not like negative space. If you create negative space in the soil environment, something's going to fill it and it's almost always going to be the bad guys. Almost always. We need to remember that because disruption of that balance adds chinks in your armor over time. And again, it's that sort of slow but progressive diminishing over time of immune health. Furthermore, and I just have to say it because I think about it all the time, if you think about even a destabilization of a few percent of processes like photosynthesis, of carbon sequestration, of nitrogen fixation, if you even bring that down by a few percent, you affect climate, you affect everything. You create soil carbon with those microorganisms. Any effect, especially at broad applications on huge pieces of ground, you, you drive that up, I mean, exponentially up. Those are things that we are still not looking at adequately in, this, in the literature. Many studies have looked at the effect of glyphosate on soil microbial communities. A lot of the early ones looked at primarily soil respiration. So um, one of the early measures of like the health of bacterial the health of bacterial communities was just soil respiration because that's how the microbes are breathing. So just that measuring of respiration. However, as we now know, the way glyphosate affects things is by sequestering cations, which control bio, biological functions in microorganisms as well. And so that destabilization over time is going to need a net sort of look over time. So those early studies really only looked at respiration and they weren't tracking population dynamics or population changes over time. Disruption of that pathway, the Shikimet pathway, can be compared, though, to the depression of your immune system. It's like an immuno disease. And so now we have a lot more data on the cumulative effects on soil communities with prolonged and repeated use of glyphosate. So a lot of these studies have looked at Roundup Ready crops because this has changed the game. Roundup Ready crops have been genetically engineered to be able to bypass the Shikimet pathway. That's bacterial genetics that have been engineered into plants so that you can spray glyphosate directly onto those forage and cereal crops. So things like soy, corn, wheat, rye, lots of them now. Um, basically, instead of doing a spot treatment or a, or a weed treatment of glyphosate, there's now a broadcast application over the entire field, not even just once, but often several times in a, in a uh, season. Analysis of those crop rotations on population dynamics in the soil have shown that reducing bacteria, which are the main ones that actually make plant available forms of um, mineral nutrition, have very high morbidity at application rates that are well below recommended field rates. This includes beneficial strains of Agrobacterium, Arthrobacter, Alcalogenes, Bacillus, <laughs> Enterobacter, Erwinia, the fluorescent pseudomonads, which are really important. They're the indolacetic acid producing bacteria, and also Rhizobium. That, that one should ring a bell. So this shows root nodulation and nitrogen fixing um, plants. So those are, the, um, those are those little nitrogen-containing capsules that form on the roots of nitrogen-fixing plants. And that, those are the bacteria that make that happen. Those are those uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, rhizobia. The declines in those, um, in those bacteria are especially concerning because they not only facilitate access to those nutrients, but they also play key roles in maintaining a stasis with the other guys in the soil. So reducing and oxidizing is important to keep the flow of nutrients in the soil stable. If you have too much of one or too much of the other, then the plants can't get what they need in the right quantities and at the right times. That stasis is, we're losing it, basically. I mean, the declines in these, <laughs> have you guys noticed that now when you go and you buy your clover seed or whatever, it comes with an inoculum? 
Many seeds now come with an inoculum. That never used to be true. You should not have to inoculate for what's free. You know, these used to do this job for free. Now we have to pay extra for that. And this is a good time to talk about the issue of resistance. Um, it takes about 4,000 times more glyphosate to kill a pathogenic bacteria and, and more, most of our fungal pathogens than it does to kill the beneficials. Glyphosate's broad spectrum activity is both herbicidal and antimicrobial, is toxic at fractions of field rates to beneficial microorganisms, fungi and forbs, that pose no competitive threat to our plants, really. But if you look at things like blackberries and thistles, and you were to try to just go out and kill those with glyphosate, it takes a lot. <laughs> it takes a lot if it can even be done. I have not seen anybody win a war with glyphosate. There are at least also 40 plant diseases that at the turn of the century were under control, considered to be obsolete, in fact, because there were cultural practices and management practices that effectively dealt with controlling those organisms. Forty of those have reemerged as key threats to the stability of our agricultural system. That's very concerning. And that balance between oxidizing and reducing bacteria and fungi is what we're losing. Beneficial fungi, like mycorrhizae, that's so critical to grapes especially, those are the, I mean, those are the organisms for grape plants that really make phosphorus available for us. I mean, they do the, they do the heavy lifting for us. And they also show sensitivity with prolonged exposure. And again, unfortunately, pathogenic fungi like fusarium, which was a few slides back, fusarium is one of the few soil-borne organisms that can actually metabolize glyphosate beyond the aminomethylphosphonate point. That's concerning because there's so much of it in the environment now that fusarium has literally a banquet that could take it 100 years to even make a dent in. And fusarium is one of those pathogens that is becoming more and more important every year. This is just to kind of look at some of the factors affecting the the long-term effects of glyphosate in our soils. AMPA, or aminomethylphosphonate, is the primary metabolite of glyphosate. It's the, I mean, it's, the, it's called the degraded form of glyphosate. So one of the, one of the early um, ways that glyphosate was really sold for being safe and for being um, something that you could use indiscriminately was that it degraded rapidly. Well, that's because that amino acid part looks like meat and potatoes to soil organisms. They're usually able to get one carbon atom off of that thing, and that gets you to AMPA, aminomethylphosphonate. But AMPA itself is a patented chelator. It is, nearly as, it is nearly as powerful as glyphosate in terms of being able to chelate cations, and it's also much more mo mobile in the soil. So it, its ability to absorb to clay is actually a little bit less, and so it's much more fluid in the environment. It gets into water a lot quicker. And so, again, it's degraded, but only one step, and it's still having the same effect on our plants. Within the plant, there are virtually no functions that aren't hampered by inadequate nutrition. I think I've said that enough times. The chelation of those critical nutrients, just like in the human body, it's, it, it's an insidious process. It takes time. Symptoms are often transient, cumulative. They lack causal agents. <laughs> the natural functions in climate and water availability and other things will often make you think, uh, it could be this or it could be that. But the point is that you see a lesser and lesser. It's not a totality especially in systems like ours, where they're very powerful to begin with, and we have quite a bit of clay. Those effects are gonna take years to see, but they are going to really make a difference in the sustainability of our systems. If you just consider the role of manganese, a cation which, as you can see, as a micronutrient, is needed in very, very low quantities, the ability to meet the needs for physiological function um, it plays such an irreplaceable role in so many pathways. Any depletion in our soils over time is going to accumulate and it's going to, sh it's going to show up in ways that we aren't necessarily going to be able to tie to glyphosate use itself. 
but those over time cumulative effects, I think we need to be more mindful about what we're really seeing. Plant hormones like the auxin, cytokinins, gibberellins, those are all driving the cycles of growth in our plants and in all plant crops. The synthesis of those hormones is regulated by, surprise, enzymes, <laughs> most of which are depressed or immobilized by the chelation of minerals by glyphosate. Of particular interest in our community are those final weeks before harvest, so the magical time. So most of the bulk of the season, as you guys all know, is about the macronutrients, and we all know how important those are, but those are the ones that make our canopies and really drive the season. But the very early part of the season and the very end of the season, which are arguably the most important times for us, those are the times when our plants are going to be especially good at sacrificing the now for the forever. Our plants do not give a shit about our wine. They care about living. And so in a, in a system where they don't have adequate micronutrition, they don't have access to what they need, they're going to sacrifice that final push, the, the window dressing that makes wine beautiful for permanent storage. If they don't feel like they have what they need, they're going to go into survival mode. That ability to finish the season is really just gravy from the plant's perspective. 15 bricks gets you a good seed. That's what I like to say. <laughs> so now we'll get to the wine. Remember the basics. Alcohol is a metabolic product of the activity of microorganisms, and it's a chemical process. Glyphosate is systemic. In plants, it accumulates in reproductive tissues. And for us, that's the grape. And that's the rub. And while there's really perilously little information in the literature about glyphosate and wine specifically, I promise you there's more coming. And we can start with the things that we do know and what literature there is, because the chemistry is pretty, pretty easy, actually. And just to stay in front of any confusion, I, I am not suggesting that anybody in this room or anywhere, frankly, um, that glyphosate is getting into the wine because people are out there spraying the canopies of their graves. I, 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 I'm certainly not suggesting that. I have every confidence that if you're in this room and you've used Roundup or you do use Roundup, that you're taking care to avoid any contact with green tissue. But it does get into the wine. Whether it's through access points in the trunk, root uptake, accidental drift, rainwater, whatever, even in organic vineyards, I tested lots of wines from Oregon, California, and Washington. It's in the wine. AMPA is definitely in the wine. And while none of the Oregon samples that I tested tested above the MRL, so the maximum residual levels that are allowed by the United States government, which are pretty arbitrary, most of the California samples, even the organically grown ones, did. And they certainly had very concerning levels of AMPA and a lot of the Washington ones did as well. And that's post-fermentation. And what's interesting to me about this is actually the pre-fermentation presence of glyphosate in the must. Because if it's in the wine, it's in the must. And if you think about a chelator in your wine must, that's more interesting to me than actually what's ending up in the wine, which we should all be concerned about for the really obvious reasons. And I also want to just take a second to say, this. This thing is done. I mean, the, the science is out there now. It may take another administration to really blow this up, and I hope it doesn't, but I want our community to be ahead of this because farmers never win, okay? When this does really blow up, if you want your property values to start going up right now, just stop using this because truly, when this does come out, the burden is going to be unfortunately placed on the people who can least bear it. Okay. The pre-fermentation pre presence of glyphosate is at least as concerning as what ends up in the wine. Whether you inoculate or you don't, the organisms that are responsible for the conversion of sugar into alcohol and malic acid into lactic acid 
Those are single-celled organisms that do have the shikimid pathway. Their presence in the environment, on our fruit, on our walls, in the winery, in the soil, has everything to do with how we're managing those environments. Knowing that yeast prefer amino acid nitrogen to feed themselves during the fermentation process, it should not come as a surprise that the more aggressive commercial strains of yeast actually look at that glycine part of the, of the glyphosate molecule and want to, and want to eat it. <laughs> and that process is going to yield AMPA, and that's why a lot of the wine samples have more AMPA than they have actual glyphosate. But that's as far as they can get with it. And by ingesting that or by making use of it, it actually diminishes their own metabolism. So they get sluggish, they can't do their job as well. And just remember, I mean, alcohol conversion is a chemical process. We're interrupting it in many ways with this very, very simple but very powerful molecule. We all know that, so this, this little picture up at the top is wine in the big picture, so like you guys know most of it's water, a little bit of alcohol, and then everything else, that tiny little slice is everything else, and then the everything else is broken down in the, in the second pie chart. And we all know that everything else is what's really important in wine. Between the phenolic compounds, the acids, and the minerals, many of these minor components can be affected by the presence of a powerful chelator. Some interesting work has been done looking at amino acids and yeast metabolism in vineyards that are treated with glyphosate as a weed treatment. The results are particularly interesting. So they did this trial where they were using just um, urea, so nitrogen urea, and then glyphosate, a control, and then glyphosate plus urea. And I highlighted the middle just for you to look at because you can see that the depletion of amino acids is pronounced. Um, if you just control, if you just compare the control to the glyphosate treatment. And it also showed a, a tremendous depletion in yeast metabolism during the fermentation process. And this can be due to kind of a twofold thing. You have the implications for yeast of the glyphosate being basically poisonous to them, but then also the pulling and sequestering of amino, of, of amino acids and the depletion of amino acids because they're not being produced would also stall those ferments. Another impl important implication of the study, um, this study in particular, is just to um, basically reinforce this very hotly debated topic of whether or not glyphosate uptake by roots is a thing. Because forever I had people throwing it in my face that that's just not possible, that it's only green active tissue. Well, this study alone really backs that up because this is a, um, a, a previously untreated system where they were only treating the weeds and the vine rows and it was in the wine. So that's a thing. It, it gets into the wine. And I've said this before, but glyphosate is incredibly stable. I mean, if you, if you take it in a laboratory, you can't burn it, you can't autoclave it. That, it's pretty incredible. I mean, if you were the guy who found it, I mean, you'd be really impressed with yourself, just as, from a chemist standpoint. Um, and that primary metabolite, AMPA, is basically just a, a t littler version of itself. It still does the main work of what glyphosate does. And that action of chelation, the reduction of amino acids for yeast metabolism, protein synthesis, and subsequently the aromatic compounds and phenolic compounds that are really kind of what wine is all about should be enough to raise concern. But the action of glyphosate directly on the yeast and bacteria, especially in that early phase. So it's become more and more important. I've observed in the community over the last couple of years just a lot more attention to like DNA fingerprinting of who's fermenting your wine. Because a lot of people who do native fermentations, they want to know what that picture looks like. And so that early phase of competitive fermentation, that's where a lot of people feel complexity is built. Those strains that come in from the field are not usually the finishers. They're not the strongest ones in the bunch. Those are the ones that are going to be first affected by glyphosate. The ones we grow in labs and replicate in labs, those are tougher. I mean, they're just inherently tougher. They've gone through a process of processing. So they have a higher tolerance for these things. Those 
things that come in off the vineyard naturally, natively, those are going to be first and foremost targeted by glyphosate. So this is that list of enzymes targeted by glyphosate. There's a lot more of them. I have an exhaustive list in my bibliography if you want to look at them. But the word systemic means spread throughout, system-wide, affecting a whole. Wine is the result of a metabolic process that occurs in microorganisms that convert sugars into acids, gases, and alcohol. Glycolysis, which is that picture in the background, glycolysis alone relies heavily on the coenzymes ATP and NADH. You can see that they just sort of rotate in the background of that process of glycolysis. And you can see those show up here on this list, and they're actually more affected than the EPSPS enzyme. Minerality. You've said it, you've said the word, and even if you've only said it to a million different consumers and navel-gazing sommeliers who have to say that word over and over again without really knowing what it means, minerals are a major component in wine, especially in the minutia that make wines different from one another. And as a powerful mineral chelator floating around in your wine, that's just something to think about. So as I pointed out, the literature is anemic about glyphosate or any other pesticide activity. I mean, seriously, like if you go and, and try to figure out if you spray an insecticide, not even an herbicide, what does it do to your plant? People don't research that stuff. People don't have to say what that does. One of the factors that influenced the banning of glyphosate in several European countries was actually the discovery by German brewers that they couldn't ferment their grain because there was so much glyphosate that the yeast couldn't do their job. Beer changes people's lives. <laughs> and there are even more aspects of wine and fermentation that I think we could talk about, and I would love to do that, but because this has already been a long time and I'm, I'm very conscious of your, um, of your dedication and devotion here, I'll leave that for people who want to go down that hole with me another time. The Shikimit pathway comes with a very high metabolic cost. It is very metabolically costly. The bypass for the Shikimit pathway, that bacterial genetic that they actually put into Roundup Ready crops, that's even more metabolically costly. And humans and animals probably a long time ago in our evolutionary history dropped that pathway because we can get those aromatic amino acids out of our food, or at least we think we can. <laughs> this does not diminish the importance of those compounds for animals, however. Quite the contrary. The essential amino acids are essential because we cannot live without them and we are completely dependent on our food to get them. The aromatic amino acids, tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine, in higher animals are, ubiqu are completely and universally used for protein synthesis, first and foremost, but they're also critical catalysts for enzyme pathways in our own bodies. And those pathways, just to name a few, regulate dopamine, they regulate our circadian ryth rhythms of rest and wakefulness, our gut and brain communication, that's probably the most important one. Those aromatic amino acids make those things happen. We, we cannot make those things in our bodies. Our own microbiome, so our gut microbiome, is populated by bacteria that regulate the av availability of these and other amino acids that we get from our food. In the grand scheme of things, so in the long history of human activity, the, um, the survival of human beings, the expansion of our giant brains, the functionality of our giant brains, and, and now the deterioration of our brains is empirically the result of our relationship with our food, the nutrients therein, and the structure and function of the bacteria in our gut. We cannot derive nutrition from our food without our microbes. Our brain function relies upon the chemicals that they produce and those interrelated and very intricate processes.
our gut microbiome has both good and bad guys, just like the soil. This is a very, very similar situation. At sub-recommended field application rates, nearly all of our beneficial gut bacteria, this is from a poultry study, but that's because they're not really looking at this in humans yet, um, are sensitive to glyphosate entering the, the digestive system. It takes 10 to 100 fold the amount of glyphosate to target pathogenic microbes in our gut. Altering the diversity and the makeup of that biome alters our own physiology. Glyphosate interrupts this function of our CYP cytochrome enzymes. CYP cytochrome enzymes are at the heart of the communication between our gut microbes and our brains. And while those pathways are very difficult to study in vitro, we now know a lot about the, the relationship between what's being now called gut dysbiosis or the sort of um, diminishing and disruption of the stasis between good and bad in our guts and high brain function and the relationship of that to a disease epidemics including Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and autism. One of my favorite gut quotes is from a, an MD, a research MD at Tufts University, and she very famously said, a thin wall, one cell thick, stands between its host, the gut microbes, and disaster. That sounds very strong, but it is utterly true. One-celled organisms are controlling our function, and they are very, very sensitive to this very powerful chemical in our systems. Very low amounts. A tenth of a part per billion interrupts very many functions in our bodies. Our brain, gut, and reproductive function relies upon the chemicals that are produced in this place. We're all aware of current concerns related to the overuse of antibiotics and the increase in diseases and conditions related to resistant pathogens. If you were to take all of the most commonly prescribed antibiotics for animal and human diseases that get sent out from a doctor or sent away from a hospital, amoxicillin, penicillin, all the other words, um, and you were to add them all up for a year in the United States, it's about 30 million pounds of antibiotics that are prescribed for human and animal use in the United States in a year. You can compare that to 300 million pounds of glyphosate that gets sprayed indiscriminately now in our environment, especially now that we're using Roundup Ready crops because now we're applying them systematically to giant swaths of food crops. Glyphosate deteriorates the biological armies of beneficial partners that we have in the soil, in our plants, and in our bodies, while at the same time stimulating populations because of creating that negative space of soil-borne pathogens which have evolved pretty literally to make lemonade out of lemons. They're always way better at finding, um, finding a way to make use of what's toxic to somebody else. And when you couple that with the immobilization of critical mineral nutrients, our immunity and resistance is compromised twofold in our body and in our environment. So just take this in for a minute. In vineyard use, I know glyphosate is really only a weed treatment. And we can talk about how important it is to control weeds in vineyards. But we are agriculture. We are part of a community of people. The introduction of Roundup Ready cereals and soy into the U.S. agricultural system over the last several decades has literally changed the game. The way this chemical is being used now compared to how it was being used 30 years ago, we're in a new paradigm. And it's going to take a lot of work, but we've got to start turning this big-ass boat around. Insertion of bacterial genetics into soy, corn, wheat, and others has really changed that model for herbicide use. Instead of using Roundup as a weed killer, a spot treatment, or pre-plant broadcast, Roundup is now being sprayed directly on our food at rates as high as 450 grams per acre. The EPA and the FDA have increased maximum residual levels several times in the last 20 years, not because all of a sudden it's safe for us to consume a whole lot more of it, 
but because our food system is that contaminated. So I've said words and I've repeated words a lot today. Symptom, disease, correlation, causation, interrelated, dynamic, systemic, dampened, diminished. It may well be that the ultimate human transgression is that our timeline and our sense of time and of our time informs our decisions, our processes, our observations, but especially our actions. And that would be one thing <laughs> if our actions didn't affect every other thing on the planet in the way that, that it is now. The dampening, the diminishing, the less and less. Our actions on these systems and the functions of our environment where everything is interconnected, we miss that, we've missed everything. The key to reparation is in a new game. It's a long game. That's the only game. We are the workers of the land. And there's no, there's no short term there. This is about the long game. True solutions will require patient, thoughtful, educated eyes, hands, minds, and hearts. And the burden of proof has to be on us. It cannot be on the natural world. I sympathize really deeply with the, with the idea that there's a magic wand. Everybody wants that to be true, especially the hardest working. We need a magic wand more than anybody else does, and I totally get that. But there isn't one. Hard work is good work. And I think that we just need to change what we think is good work. There are a lot of people out there now, there are a lot of kids in college who really want to do something meaningful with, they, with their lives. They want to change the cubicle. They pay a lot of money to go to CrossFit. I mean, I think that there's a, there's a, a real opportunity to change farming and the way that we look at farming and bring it back into the nobility. I mean, 100 years ago, doctors weren't that cool. <laughs> the Industrial Revolution was really at the heart of the industrialization of farming. The identification of nitrogen and phosphorus as critical factors in plant growth led to the manufacture of our synthetic fertilizers, allowing for the onset of increasingly intensive forms of agriculture. The discovery of vitamins and their role in animal nutrition and human nutrition in the first two decades of the 20th century brought about the wide use of supplements, which in the 1920s allowed for certain livestock to be brought indoors, which <laughs> prevented their exposure from those natural elements. Um, and the discovery of antibiotics and vaccines facilitated raising livestock in larger and larger numbers indoors because of the reduction of that disease. And finally, the tremendous surge in chemical synthesis for use in World War II gave us our pesticides. Between 1820 and 1975, world agricultural production doubled four times. It doubled four times. At the same time, in that same time, the number of people working the land shrunk exponentially as machines and chemicals replaced hands and eyes. In the 1930s, 25%, one quarter, one in four people that you would walk into on the street worked in agriculture. It was a farmer, one in four people. In 2002, that was one and a half percent. The World War II ratio of farm worker to consumer was one farm worker to 11 consumers. And in 2002, that number was one to 90. The number of farms has decreased also exponentially over time, concentrating ownership into fewer and fewer hands. Fewer people managing more and more and more ground more and more distance between each other, between the communities that supported them, and the people that could help them figure out the solutions to their problems. When a chemical rep comes around and you haven't seen somebody in weeks, you just want to talk to somebody. <laughs> the cross-fence conversations that used to happen and the sharing of knowledge disappeared as the successful products of the American chemical scientists and engineers swept across the landscape like a dust bowl. Methods and, tra and traditions of agrarian America. I, this, I mean, I, I don't say this to be hokey. 
that's real science. You know, the way we, the way we farmed, that was scientifically based. They didn't do the science, but we could. I mean, that was, that was real. And that farm community and the strength of those relationships renders, rendered those, the loss of that, rendered those who remained increasingly vulnerable. Generations and generations of treasured wisdom and knowledge were lost, literally overnight. I mean, kind of like it never happened, because that, that period of time was so protracted and everything was growing so fast that it was almost like it never happened. And if you try to find a farmer out there who does remember when what we now consider as baseline or normal was their low, you can't find them hardly anymore. So now I just want to take a minute to think about herbicides and grapes. I, th I hope that this has given a fairly clear picture of what glyphosate is and how it works in our systems. But I, I want to talk now about why we use it. We use glyphosate for weed control to maintain a vegetation-free environment under our vines. And that whole discussion, I think, um, has been too short. We, as farmers, fear what we think we can't control. And I, again, I'm super sympathetic with that. The whole discussion about weeds in the undervine area is one that deserves a lot more attention. Managing an ecological system, of course, means that you need to have adequate access to nutrition, to water, and that's going to be tantamount to your success. But aesthetic considerations are not relevant to ecology. Everyone has different views and tolerances, and I don't really want to debate them here because I have my own and, you know, I, I, I don't want to fight with anybody. But the relationship between tillage and water and nutrients should really be openly discussed in our community again. Because I don't think we've looked at all the ways we can skin that cat. That, I'm sorry to use that analogy. Um, but the end equation is the same. Under vine vegetation is not, it's not universally evil. I mean, you can come to my vineyard, and I invite everybody here to come to my vineyard anytime. I got really healthy weeds growing all the time. And my vines are doing really well. But I get that everybody's experience is different, and I want to help anyone who wants to look at it differently. Right, all the fluffy stuff that ends up in the bins with your, with your beautiful grapes. And also, the, you know, the transmission of diseases, you know, from anything growing up into your canopy, that's, that's a big deal, I get it. And I think that there's a lot of options. So, alternatives. I've, I've been experimenting with as many of them as I can find. Um, my husband can <laughs> tell you about our forays into animal husbandry. Um, but the role of weed and forb root biomass in stabilizing soil, stabilizing nutrients, holding water, and facilitating access to mycorrhizae, to nutrition, I think we should talk about that more. Competition is affected differently by different species, by the transpiration periodicity of that species, by its nutrient requirements, and lots of other things. I've seen evidence that contradicts a lot of what we think we know about competition and access to nutrients and water, even in late season, when the soil is healthy and when your microbes are healthy. A lot of my observations suggest that the water and nutrition that we are able to hold with roots actually outweighs what you lose in competition with tillage. And you guys all are familiar with the main alternatives to weed control and vineyard if aesthetics or if, like you say, you know, keeping it out of the canopy is important to you. And I've experimented with all of them. We have pictures, we have actual tools that we can happily discuss, but the weed bars, animals, the multi-clean, I do really mean this about the CrossFitters because those guys pay a lot of money to be in those little boxes, and we could hand them heavy hose. You could have weekend. I mean, I'm not joking about this. I'm going to call some of these gyms. 
high school football teams. I mean, labor is work, and work is good for your body. I'm just saying. And these guys do a great job on everything. <laughs> but that, too, can be looked at and, and dealt with a lot of different ways. And I think that, you know, part of, part of what I feel very blessed to be able to do, being a second-generation farmer and being able to walk into what most people work a lifetime to be able to work with, is that I can take more risks than other people. So use me. I like to take risks. I don't have a zero tolerance policy for plants, any plant, because I just don't think that that's a thing. I don't think it works. Um, I want balanced, low input systems. I want the laziest system ever. And I would love for the conversation about cover and vineyards to always be first about health and balance and stability. And if aesthetics needs to be addressed, then I'm just gently suggesting that we consider changing the conversation about what is aesthetically pleasing because I love the idea of the uneducated public looking at beautiful living things growing on a living medium and saying, that looks good, wild looks good. Because those bare strips, while they may um, attend to a certain aesthetic, come with serious implications. And I also just want to say that any system where cultivation and weed suppression are being conducted simultaneously and alongside multiple passes to control overly vigorous canopies has a mathematical problem. We are in a very powerful system here. And if we are controlling vegetation and controlling vegetation, we need to look at that math. Okay, so it's probably been two hours, and so if any of you guys want to go, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt, but if you want to stay, then this is the end. And this is where we get to talk about the elephant in the room, um, because this is where it's really going to crack open. I mean, this is where the American public is going gonna, is gonna to take notice, and they're going to start taking people to the cleaners. And that's the recent debate over carcinogenicity of glyphosate. It's being declared now as a human carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. The international agency, nobody in America yet. And that's being, um, that's being dealt with in courts. Over the years that I've researched this chemical and its unique history, and I've obsessed about it and stared at the molecule in all of its many dimensions, the biology, the physics, the chemistry, that was enough, that's enough for me. I don't like to get political with the community of people that I honor above all others. I really admire anybody who has the courage to work the land. I do not want to get into your business. I do not want to get into your politics. But if you do care about this cancer thing, then we'll go there now. This is how new herbicides get approval through the EPA. This is the process. This process has not changed significantly or at all since the EPA was established in 1970 by President Richard Nixon, namely to address the concerns about environmental pollution. The mandate of the EPA is to house in one agency federal research, monitoring, and standard setting and enforcement activities to protect our environment. The amounts for safe levels in our food and forage crops are under the purview of both the FDA and the EPA. The shift in our agri agricultural production to Roundup Ready crops has led to several increases in these maximum allowable limits. And like I said, those limits have been changed not because suddenly it's safer to consume more of them but because our food systems have higher and higher amounts of glyphosate in them. They would have to reject 85% of the food produced in this country. So those levels keep going up. And again, there's no mechanism in a GE plant that can metabolize glyphosate. There's nothing in a GE plant that can break that down. And therefore, 
the amount of glyphosate that ends up in our food is at an unprecedented level. The accumulation of many crops coming together in these commercial products, I mean, look at that. A tenth of a part per billion is enough to, to disrupt endocrine function. That's reproductive function. Cheerios. And then there's what's showing up in our urine and our breast milk. Drinking water, 700 parts per billion is what's allowed. And there are places very near here that test higher than that. The use of Roundup in treating our waterways, the city of Salem, city of Yakima, using aquatic applications of glyphosate multiple times in a year, directly into the groundwater. And the safety and science behind the technology of GE is often misrepresented. Whether, whether or not, because again, this is political and I really, I really, this is not judgment, but the genes that enable that bypass for the Shikimet pathway require a viral promoter to get expression. Old genetic engineering relied upon a viral promoter to get insertion of that genetic trait into a plant. There's new ways of doing it now, but they're not successful yet in, in crop plants, and so this is what we're still doing. <laughs> that was done on, a, on the promise that the, um, the release of GE crops would allow farmers to use less pesticides. And now we're using them on the food three to five times in a season. And it's still to the same effect. I mean, it still accumulates. I mean, th those are still plants. It still accumulates in the reproductive tissue. That, that point of accumulation is the part that you eat. So now we're at this point where glyphosate actually is in our food at parts per billion more than the minerals that we need in parts per billion just to perform daily function. And those genes that code for resistance, along with those viral promoters, it turns out they're also persistent and promiscuous in the soil. The release of that genetic material, and especially the viral promoters that they use to get that insertion, when it's put into the soil and released into those soil microbial communities, that has been shown to actually transmit to, to other things like fusarium. You get an increase in virulence in your pathogenic bacteria as a and fungi as a result of the release of this genetic material into the soil. And our science just hasn't been able to keep up with it. I mean, it's not like anybody's trying to ruin the world or take down humanity with these things. It's just that the science can't keep up with how quickly we're doing this stuff. And this is where we get into some of the lawsuits that are coming about. Um, most of them are starting um, in California, for, for all the obvious reasons, left coast. But there are more than 50 lawsuits alone in the, in the Northern District um, Court of California against Monsanto about alleging that glyphosate was safe and that you know the exposure, especially dermal exposure for people who were using it as part of their job. Um, and uh, many of those people have developed cancer and there are many, many lawsuits pending in the state of California. And that's just about cancer. <laughs> but you know, for me, I just assume everybody's gonna get cancer. And I actually think that the more problematic things that this is doing in our bodies are far more insidious than cancer. Because frankly, we're, we're a lot further down the road with cancer than we are with some other more concerning things. I mean, the CDC actually predicts that within 10 years, one in two children will have autism. Um, and again, the EPA's role is not to assess the carcinogenicity of Roundup. It's to register glyphosate for sale as a pesticide. The testing that was done, the testing that was demanded for release of these products into our systems that was, that was at the discretion of the companies that wanted to register the products. And now, what we know is that glyphosate, um, through this kind of connection between the EPA 
and Monsanto and various, um, various people at the heads of these committees, th there's been a lot of collusion there. And in case you feel like this just sounds too insidious or too nefarious, I mean, just think about other products that were market first and safety and health later. I mean, these are some of the, these are some of the funnier ones that I've found. But it's just one, another, another chance to remember that our timeline is usually informed by our own mortality, and that's how we often will make our decisions, and that is often how we do our worst work. We're almost done here. So this is, um, this is actually pulled from some of the documents that have been subpoenaed by um, the Northern District of California in one of these lawsuits. And this is about the cover-up, basically, of the carcinogenicity reports. So this, this guy, Jess Rowland, who was one of the EPA scientists, um, and he was also the head of the Office of Pesticide Protection and on this committee, committee that basically decided whether or not glyphosate patents could be re-registered from um, the Monsanto Corporation. It turns out that he was very much colluding in a, in a really John Grisham-y kind of a way, beautiful email language here, where it's like, if I can kill this thing, I should get a medal. I mean, these documents have been released. It's really entertaining to read them if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and I'm going to kind of quickly flip through these. If you want to look at them, I will give you all the documents you ever wanted. But this shows some of the overlap between um, various cabinet officials and committee officials in various cabinets, so including um, the Clinton um, administration, the Obama administration. There's certainly some concerning ones now. And these are the, these are the lawsuits that are, that are pending. Um, and again, this particular letter over, I mean, this email over here on the right, um, is one of my favorites um, because this Monsanto scientist, she's writing to one of her superiors and she says, quote, if we went full bore involving experts from all the major areas, epi, epi tox, gene, genotox, MOA exposure, not sure who we'd get, we could be pushing 250,000 or maybe even more. A less expensive, more palatable approach might be to involve experts only for the areas of contention, epidemiology, and possibly MOA, depending on what comes out of the IARC meeting. And we ghostwrite the exposure talks and genotox sections. An option would be to add Green and Cure and Kirkland to have their names on the publication, but we would be keeping the cost down by doing the writing ourselves, and they can just edit and sign their names, so to speak. Recall that's how we handled Williams, Crows, and Monroe in 2000. Ghostwriting, it turns out, um, was at the heart of most of the studies that have been thrown in my face over the years and were used to kill the careers, and really, in a lot of cases, the lives of people who were very bravely trying to study this chemical in, a, in an independent way. This is not John Grisham, this is real life. And this is the power of our political system. But I think that the most damning part of one of these lawsuits is really just this letter that Marion Copley, who was an EPA scientist, a very decorated EPA scientist, who left the EPA in 2013 with cancer. She wrote this letter to Jess Rowland, who was the guy that I was referring to earlier. He was at the head of the OPP. He was the guy who said, if I can kill this, I should get a medal. I'm just going to read the highlights here. Since I left the agency with cancer, I've studied the tumor process extensively and I have some mechanism comments which may be very valuable to CARC based on my decades of pathology experience. I'll pick one chemical to demonstrate my points. Glyphosate was originally designed as a chelating agent and I strongly believe that this is the identical process involved in its tumor formation which is highly supported by the literature. She lists, she lists all the mechanisms by which glyphosate could cause cancer. Previously, CARC concluded that glyphosate was a possible human carcinogen. This is true. In the Reagan administration, when glyphosate was first released, the allowable amount was 0.1 parts per billion per, per milligram body weight per day per human being. And it was labeled as a possible human carcinogen. 
That just disappeared. Going back to the letter now. The kidney pathology in the animal studies would lead to tumors with other mechanisms listed above. Any one of these mechanisms alone listed cause tumors, but glyphosate causes all of them simultaneously. It is essentially certain that glyphosate causes cancer. With all of the evidence listed above, the CARC category should be changed to probable human carcinogen at least. <laughs> then she goes on to say, Jess, you and I have argued many times on CARC. This is the best part. <laughs> You often argued about topics outside of your knowledge, which is unethical. Your trivial MS degree from 1971 Nebraska is far outdated. Thus, CIRC science is 10 years behind the literature and mechanisms. For once in your life, listen to me and don't play your political conniving games with the science to favor the registrants. For once, do the right thing and don't make decisions based on how it affects your bonus. Greg Ackerman, is supposed to be our expert on mechanisms, but he never mentioned any of these concepts at CARC, and when I tried to discuss it with him, he put me off. Is Greg playing your political games as well? <laughs> your Nebraska colleague took industry funding. He clearly has a conflict of interest. Just promise me not to ever let Anna on the CARC committee. She was. Her decisions don't make rational sense. If anyone at, OP at OPP is taking bribes, it's her. Her last sentence says, I have cancer, and I don't want these serious issues in HED to go unaddressed before I go to my grave. She died in 2014. I really want to thank you guys for coming today. It means a lot to me. Um, and I want to say again, if you care to hear it, that this, for me, is about my love for this community. I really obsess about things, and I, I I know that I'm not a normal person, but I think about your grapes and your wine and your families, and I want you to have this information. I want everybody to have this information. So I really appreciate your time today. I know it was a lot, and um, don't hesitate to reach out with anything but bullets. Thank you again.